back here in church again, but where are all of you? Of course, we don't know how long uh, it's going to be before we're all able to meet together normally to sing and to chat and to hug and to eat cakes together. That's assuming that Lionel hasn't woofed them all before we get here. But uh, at least we're able to be in church to share God's message with you. And uh, that's maybe one kind of uh, first step towards normality again. The message today is going to be a little bit uncomfortable, I think. It may be uncomfortable for you, because I'm going to be talking about how very often there's a big gap between what we say we believe and the way we actually live our lives. It's certainly going to be uncomfortable for me. Put it this way, if at any stage you feel I'm pointing the finger at anyone, you can be sure I've got three fingers that are pointing back at me. Today's about rhetoric and reality, about our public face and our private life, and about how often there's a yawning great gulf between them. We're, we're of course familiar with that in the world around us. Government advisers help set down rules for lockdown and then they not only cheerfully ignore them, but they go on to justify their actions afterwards. Utilities assure us when we try to contact them, your call is very important to us. And then they keep us hanging on the end of the line for 45 minutes. And we could spend all day, couldn't we, looking at examples of hypocrisy out there in the world. But actually, of course, the issues are closer to home for God's people. And they always have been. We're going to read about that in Nehemiah chapter 5. Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their fellow Jews. Some were saying... We and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we've got to get grain. Others were saying we've, we're mortgaging our fields, our vineyards and our homes to get grain during the famine. Still others were saying we've had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Although we're of the same flesh and blood as our fellow Jews, and although our children are as good as theirs, yet... We have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we're powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. When I heard their outcry and these charges, I was furious. I pondered them in my mind and then I accused the nobles and the, the officials. I, I told them, you're charging your own people interest. And so I called together a large meeting to deal with them and I said, as far as possible we've brought back our fellow Jews who were sold to the Gentiles and now you're selling your own people only for them to be sold back to us. They kept quiet because they couldn't find anything to say. And so I went on, what you're doing isn't right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? I and my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain, but, but let's stop charging interest. Give back to them immediately their fields, their vineyards, olive groves and houses, and also the interest you're charging them, 1% of the money, grain, new wine and olive oil. We'll give it back, they said, and we will not demand anything more from them. We'll do as you say. And then I summoned the priests, and I made the nobles and the officials take an oath to do what they had promised. I also shook out the folds of my robe and said, in this way may God shake out of their house and possessions anyone who doesn't keep this promise. So may such a person be shaken out and emptied. At this the whole assembly said, Amen, and praised the Lord. Mm -hmm. And the people did as they promised. Moreover, from the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, until his 32nd year, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allotted to the governor. But the earlier governors, those preceding me, placed a heavy burden on the people. They took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to food and wine. Their assistants also lorded it over the people. But out of reverence for God, I didn't act like that. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on this wall. 
All my men were assembled there for the work. We didn't acquire any land. And furthermore, 150 Jews and officials ate at my table, as well as those who came to us from the surrounding nations. Each day, one ox, six choice sheep, and some poultry were prepared for me. Every 10 days, an abundant supply of wine of all kinds. In spite of all this, I never demanded the food allotted to the government because the demands were heavy on these people. Remember me with favour, my God, for all that I've done for these people. Well, the reading is a window into Nehemiah's personal integrity. While the work of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem is going on, life is exceptionally hard for the ordinary people. Many are going seriously hungry. The need for grain which they can't afford is a matter of life and death for them. Some of them are having to mortgage fields and homes to pay for it. Some are even selling their children into slavery out of sheer desperation. The comparatively rich are getting richer. The poor are being driven to despair. It's not a situation totally unknown in today's world, of course. And the question is, how is Nehemiah going to deal with it? Well, he could make all the right noises. I really care about the disadvantaged and do nothing. He could make some sort of token response while everyone's upset and then quietly drop it later. We're going to set up a commission of inquiry to report back in three years' time. Question is, will Nehemiah's reality match his rhetoric? Is he going to act with integrity to protect his people or look after number one first? Well, when the problem is brought to Nehemiah's attention, his first response is anger. But, but he doesn't react openly straight away. He gives himself time to think. And then he calls the nobles and the officials together. These are the guys with the money and the power. And he tackles the issues head on. You're charging our people interest on loans. That's against the law of Moses. It's got to stop. You're selling our people into slavery again. And again, that's a no-no. I want that stopped as well. And he doesn't just accuse them, he sets an example. He says, look, all of us with resources are having to lend to the poor. But I and the folks with me, we're not charging interest, and neither should you be. So you need to repay the interest you've been taken. And where you've taken possession of fields and vineyards and olive groves so that their owners can't even earn their living to pay you back, those assets get returned to their rightful owners as from today. His action is decisive and immediate. And what gives it authority, of course, is that Nehemiah is able to say, we are all doing this together. I'm doing exactly what I'm asking you to do. Once he's got their agreement, he brings in the priests to witness the uh, commitment that they've made. Um, and uh, in verse 13, he says, I also shook out the folds of my robe and said, In this way may God shake out of their house and possessions anyone who doesn't keep this promise. There's an element of passion in this, isn't there? And then everybody who's assembled there add their voice to confirm it. A great big amen goes up from everybody. Nehemiah's concern for the poor, though, does not just happen when the spotlight is shone on him. It is right from the moment that he's set foot in Judah that he's set a different pattern from those who've gone before. He rejects the gravy trade. There's a generous food allowance that's stipulated by the Persian king, but Nehemiah doesn't make use of that. He has the authority to levy taxes to support a luxurious lifestyle, but he never does so. It's not that he's going short, of course, not by a long short, but... He's generous in his hospitality and in providing for others. So, that's what's going on in chapter 5. And the point that I want to pick up on is not so much that Nehemiah is some sort of proto-socialist or whatever. The point I want to pick up on is the integrity of this man. He, he doesn't have a public face that is caring and godly and then a completely different private face when he's on his own. The private Nehemiah is the same as the public Nehemiah. Doing the right thing before it becomes an issue, before people start looking at him. His reality matches his rhetoric. Frankly, <laughs> this is, 
it's a huge challenge to those of us in Christian leadership and mission because we, of course, preach and we teach commitment, prayer, love, holiness, evangelism, we say all the right things. Prayer is vital. God is challenging us to be holy. He calls us to love one another, even the people we find difficult. He asks us to share our faith with those who don't know Christ, and then we get home. And all too often the story is a very different one. Maybe we struggle to pray. Maybe we're not great at sharing our faith with non-Christians. Perhaps we gripe and complain about the people we find difficult. Maybe our computer and social media use doesn't look all that holy either. And I have to say, it is sadly an exceptional Christian leader who does not live with some significant gap between what we preach and what we live. And so here are the three fingers pointing back at me, because in truth, I have never been, in this respect, an exceptional Christian leader. I'm one of the strugglers. But you don't get off so easily either. Because this might apply in a special way to preachers and leaders, but it does also apply to each and every one of us. In normal times, I might frame this in the following way. I, that you come to church with your Christian face on, your happy, committed, believing face, but you take it off again when you go back to the real world. But of course, these are not normal times, and none of us goes to church these days with any kind of face on at all. But still, it is possible to have a theoretical church or Christian persona, which is not at all the same as the real you and me, and that's what I'm, I'm driving at today. Only you will know what the real issues are for you. But let me throw out a few questions. What about character? I guess you, like me, would say that Jesus is Lord of my life. Uh, you may have sung the words, all to Jesus I surrender. But in real life, are you somebody who likes to get their own way most of the time? What about grace? As Christians, we're committed to a life of love because we know how deeply Christ has loved us. But does that show in our real world? Are we unforgiving or argumentative? Gossipy, loving to dish out the dirt? Inconsiderate? Are there signs of grace at every level of our lives? Or humility? Are you one of those folks who proclaims loud and long that we are all miserable sinners, totally dependent on God's mercy, and then go home or to work, resistant to the idea, in point of fact, that you might ever get things wrong? Are you slow to apologise? Slow to admit if you get things wrong? Resistant to putting up your hand when you made a mess of things? Trust. In God we trust. Well, on a Sunday we do. But maybe we spend the rest of the week anxious and worrying. In other words, not trusting God. Some of the hymns that we sing, you know, they're downright dangerous, aren't they? Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Well, I wonder how many of us sing this, but in our real lives we're devoted to making money or spending money or succeeding in material terms so that we can sort of wave it all in front of people and say, look what I've managed. The guy who was the pastor before me in one of my churches used to ask the church members, is your wallet converted yet? It was not a question that made him very popular. But it's a good question. Are your finances, are your bank balance converted yet? Think of the different places where we live our, our Christian lives and ask yourself how truly your commitment to Christ is expressed there. In the car, driving. Are you a model of patience and consideration? In front of the computer or the TV screen. You know, it's not unknown for Christians to preach purity and watch porn with your wife, with your husband, with your children. Now, I'm not a big fan of seaside rockets, gooey, horrible stuff, and it's terrible for the teeth, but one thing you can say for it, wherever you break it, it will still carry exactly the same message. And I suspect that would not be completely true of any of us. I suspect that there would be a gap between our rhetoric and our reality, between what we profess and what we practice. 
If you feel you may be the exception to this rule, do let me know. And I'll check it out with the other members of your family. So, look, we've got issues with integrity. And you may at this point feel like reaching for the bottle of pills and topping yourself, and I, I'm going to advise against that, if I may. We're never going to get this 100% right, but from Nehemiah's example, I want to suggest four ways we can move forward. First is to face the challenge, and that might seem blindingly obvious, but in point of fact, it can be all too easy simply to let the challenge go right over our heads. Scarcely notice it at all. Water of our duck's back. There's a whole raft of ways we can refuse to look the challenge of integrity in the face. We can deflect it or ignore it. I don't think that applies to me. Well, uh, we live in a very different world today, don't we? We can minimise it. Oh, my behaviour is just one of those things. It's, it's just me. Sure, I've got a bit of a temper, I, or I'm an inveterate worry, but that's just me. It's the way I'm made. Not sure what the Creator thinks about that. None of this is perfect, you know. By which we mean to imply that, therefore, our faults really don't matter. We can minimise. We can justify. You know, that's how the world works, isn't it? Tax evasion, sharp practice in business, little white lies, everybody does it for goodness sake. You know, Nehemiah could have had that attitude. All the other governors levy taxes and take up their official allowances. Why shouldn't I? The nobles and the officials could have responded like that. Everybody lends and charges interest. They all take advantage. To their credit, they chose not to justify their lack of integrity. They faced the challenge and they told the truth to themselves about what they're doing. Secondly, they openly acknowledged the reality. Wrongdoing is, is not something to be dealt with in secrecy, behind closed doors. And Nehemiah brings what's being done wrong into the public arena. That's important because sin thrives in the darkness, it thrives in secrecy, and it shies away from the light. And actually I think this is true in the life of nations and societies as well. You know, we think in our society that the way we keep our leaders accountable in a democracy is by being able to vote them out every five years. And there's some truth in that, of course, but another vital way that we keep folks accountable is through free access to information. One of the vital defences of democracy is the free press, the free media. The fact that if you are corrupt, if you're behaving badly, there are people who are liable to unearth what you're doing wrong and tell people about it. Not everyone in power appreciates that. Fake news, enemy of the people, etc. Actually, we should honour and we should try and protect those who bring serious wrongdoing into the light because we need them. Sin thrives in the dark, it wilts in the light. So Nehemiah publicly draws attention to what these guys are doing. And uh, in verse 12, he makes sure that they make a commitment. We will give it back. And then the whole assembly witnesses the commitments that they've made to put things right. Everybody shouts Amen. There's always much more chance, you know, of people keeping their promises when everybody has been around to hear them do it. It is so important for us to be able to say openly before one another, you know, I get things wrong. Because sometimes Christians play a sort of game of let's pretend. We come together with happy, holy Christian faces on. How are things with you? Great, just great, actually. And actually, inwardly, we're a bit of a mess. Or we've had an argument with the family on our way here, or whatever it is. If there is one thing in the Gospels that Jesus absolutely hated, it's pretense. That was a big sin of the Pharisees. They were, they were hypocrites. They were like actors in a first century play wearing a mask to show who they were pretending to be, playing a part that really wasn't them at all. Now on stage there's nothing wrong with that because everybody knows what you're doing and at the end of the day nobody's trying to pull the wool over your eyes. But in real life, in real life and amongst the people of God it's lethal. 
That's why I love the fact that um, Eric's always really upfront about his, his sort of foibles and the, the things that might make him difficult to live with, with Mara and stuff. Uh, and and Henny's the same, isn't he? The, I used to be rather amused by the, the way he would describe the way he was at home, as if he was the Mad Axe murderer. But this is actually a healthy thing, you see, that we're not pretending to be better than we really are. Not hiding failure. Third thing that they did was that they opened their closed doors. Now, what do I mean by that? Ships are built with watertight compartments. Safety, they're a safety feature. It means that if you get hold below the waterline and water starts coming in, it cannot get all the way through the ship. And so even when it's damaged, even when it's hold, it doesn't sink. In a less helpful way, sometimes we operate in the same principle in our Christian lives. In Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him. And so we invite Jesus Christ into our lives, but we keep some of the doors closed. The study, yes, yes, you can come in here. Not the office, that's where I run my business. I really don't want you in there, Lord. Um, you can come into my Sundays, but not into my Mondays. You can come into my kitchen, but, but stay out of the TV room, if you like, uh, if you would, because I like to make my own choices there. And without quite saying so, we create no-go areas in our lives for Jesus as Lord. We don't want him running our business, dealing with our finances, and he can keep out of our relationships with the neighbours because we're not getting on so well with them. Now... For these guys in Nehemiah 5, they were happy for the Lord to be in their temple worship, their sacrifices, the work on the wall around Jerusalem, but they weren't allowing him to interfere with the serious business of making money. And Nehemiah refuses to let them stay in that place. All the doors have got to be opened. Every area of life needs to come under the authority of God. And for us, one of the steps towards true into, uh, integrity is to identify and to unlock each of those locked doors in our lives. All the places that we put off limits to God. All the rooms where we've, in effect, said to the Lord, but here, actually, I'm doing things my own way, if you don't mind. So I ask you, what, what are your closed doors? What are your closed doors? What rooms in your house? Are you not welcoming Jesus as Lord? Let me encourage you this afternoon, honestly, to identify them one by one and then give the Lord Jesus the keys and invite him to come in and make that place his own. Fourth thing, finally, belatedly, probably, uh, they took definite action. Everything in Nehemiah chapter 5 is very specific. The nobles and the officials renounce their claim to interest on the loans. They return goods that have been taken in trust. Nehemiah too is very specific in what he does. He, he doesn't take his tax allowance. He decides not to levy taxes. He operates an open house policy. None of this is all in the head. This is very practical, concrete decisions. I was speaking to a Christian businessman the other day. He was referring to the government's job retention scheme, whereby the government will give you a thousand pounds for each employee that's kept on after furlough comes to an end. We won't be claiming it, he said. I'm sure he could get away with it if he wanted to. But he had enough of a level of integrity to say, I don't think we really qualify, we won't take it. Now, Nehemiah was not perfect in his integrity, nor were the people that he led. But he found specific actions to move their lives closer into line with the way that before God they should have been. Well, here we are. It's easy to look at this issue of integrity and to feel completely condemned, isn't it? Here I am. I've been a Christian for 56 years and more, and still there are big issues where my life doesn't reflect what I believe and what I say. But actually, guilt is unproductive. It doesn't achieve anything very much, but repentance does. And repentance is about 
taking decisions and taking responsibility. So let's each ask ourselves, God, what action do you want me to take today? What can I change today? It won't be complete, it won't be a perfect response. There will still be issues for every one of us, but each of us can listen to the issues that the Spirit of God is putting his finger on for us. And we can make a response that is specific and substantial and practical. And we can do it now. Let's pray together, shall we? And dear God, gosh, you know that none of us feel totally, totally at ease with the question of integrity. None of us lives in a way that is properly consistent with what we profess. Thank you, Lord, that we are saved by grace, that we're accepted in Christ just as we are warts and all. But Lord, you've called us to a holy life. You've called us into a life that is shaped by the Lord Jesus. And we pray that you will help us to be honest and practical as we respond to your challenge. And Lord, would you watch over each member of our congregation? You know the joys and the struggles, the hopes and the needs. More than anything, you know that we need your presence and your grace in our hearts day by day. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Have a good week, guys.